Hello friends, good afternoon and welcome to the EduSat Network. Our topic of discussion today, friends, is going to be a continuation from a previous lecture of ours. So, very interestingly, you could also go and watch the previous one on YouTube. And so, friends, uh, today we are going to talk about beginnings of uh, classical art and as I mentioned, uh, it today is going to be a second part of Gandhar art. And uh, friends, to take up this uh, topic further, we have the same subject expert, Dr. Seema Bhava, Professor, Department of History, University of Delhi. And with this brief introduction, I welcome ma'am to the studio. Ma'am, thank you so much for coming. Hello. Uh, we discussed basically yes, uh, the last time that uh, what exactly is the region that is Gandhar and how it is a geopolitical entity that is very important because of the fact that it is at the crossroads of cultural and economic and political interactions. And secondly, we had also discussed what are the stylistic features of Gandhar art. We had kind of discussed as to what makes it uh, so distinct and uh, what is the chronology largely of the Gandhar art and how it starts from the before the common era and goes up till 4th and 5th century CE after which we see remnants of Gandhar art but matured Gandhar art is not to be found in that profusion after that after 5th, 4th and 5th century CE. We had also looked at some of the background in terms of urban centers and the kind of ethnic and cultural contacts that were there between Indo-Greeks, Bactrians, Parthians um, and the indigenous populations and how these were all amalgamating in this particular region which extends from between Oxus to Indus. So, this is a very specific region and this is not a site. This is a region. Gandhar is a region like Mathura is a site, Amravati is a site, Bharut is a site, Sanchi is a site. Uh, Gandhar is much more than just one site. We have numerous sites and sub-schools also in Gandhar. We would also kind of laid the background of how it is not in homogeneous art that there are various developments that take place. The two major art uh, objects that were being produced in the Gandhar art were of the Buddha and the Bodhisattva which we have discussed. Today we will go a little further and like discuss one very important development which was the development of Gandhar art under the Kushanas which was a distinct category of patronage that was taking place uh, both in Mathura and in Gandhar. So you have two parallel schools coming up of art one is in the northwestern region and one is in the northern region around uh, western UP, Punjab, Haryana and those areas. So what is it that makes them distinct and why is it coming up and what are the evidences that we are getting about the Kushan patronage to Gandhar art is something that we will do. Especially what we are going to look at today is how there is a transition from Indo-Greeks to Kushans in history and art that this area is something that sees waves of Indo-Greeks, Indo-Scythians, Indo-Parthians and Kushans uh, and interestingly unlike say Alexander before this or Darius the first Achaemenid king, these powers were focusing on the subcontinent that is they were focusing on north, northwestern India in terms of polity they were trying to uh, have their own coins, their own inscriptions, their own administrative units such uh, called the satraps be, uh, and uh, satrapies uh, um, uh, called satrapies which were being ruled by their own people called satraps and they had their own distinct cultural activity here. This cultural activity was something that was very distinctly subcontinental in content. Uh, content. Uh, if the styles were being borrowed and then made into a subcontinental art style, 
but the content was very subcontinental. Secondly, and more importantly, that in terms of religion, you know, they may have had when they were in Central Asia, they may have had animistic traditions, okay, that they were worshipping animals, they were worshipping nature and distinctly uh, uh, non-theistic religion, okay. But when they come to India and enter the, I, by India I mean undivided larger uh, entity, geographical entity which existed in ancient India, okay. So, here when they come into this territory, we see that they embrace a lot of Indian faiths and they are declaring themselves to be Bhagwats, that is uh, worshippers of Vishnu, right? Shaivite. So, they, we see a lot of emblems that are Shaivite in content. Then they, of course, there is a lot of Buddhist activity um, in this time and some local faiths were also being uh, being patronized by from Indo-Greeks, Gondophones, Menander to the Kushans. So, these, there is a long line of people who are embracing, uh, patronizing and making objects of art that are related to very Indian faiths. Okay? Uh, most of the major Buddhist centers of Gandhar were founded during the 2nd century AD under the powerful kings such as Kanishka. Uh, there is an increase in the patronage of Buddhist sacred areas and monastic institutions and most of the extant Gandharan architecture dates from 3rd century onwards. This includes the sites of Taxila as well as other massive monastic institutions of Takhtebahi, Sahari Bahilol, Jamal Garhi, Rani Ghat and Thareli. So, uh, late Kushan period onwards also we see that not just individual small uh, uh, stupas, but stupas with large monastic institutions are also now being patronized by the kings and uh, we have very large okay I think we need to go to the uh, yeah, we, we have a very very large amount of work that can be seen here in terms of art and architecture. Now uh, since Kushans are so important during this time uh, we will be looking at one king, Kanishk, because it is under him that Buddhism specially becomes extraordinarily important. Uh, he, under him, there is, he becomes a Buddhist himself, though of course his inscription suggests that there are a lot of Central Asian and Iranian elements in his religion, uh, but uh, he, under him, uh, a lot of uh, Buddhist literature gets written. It is also during his time that the fourth Buddhist council is held in Kashmir and a formal division between the Hinayana and Mahayana takes place. But uh, Kanishka also is important because we find a number of uh, antiquities related directly to Kanishka himself and he, he can be related to Gandhar art and is patron of Gandhar art almost directly. So the rule of Kanishka. Uh, who is the third major Kushan emperor and his dates are controversial. Some people date him to the first or to the early mid 2nd century AD and he administered his empire from two capitals. One was Purushpura which is now called Peshawar near the Khyber Pass and the other is Mathura in northern India. Under Kanishk rule, at the height of the dynasty, Kushan, Kushan dynasty controlled a large territory ranging from the Aral Sea through the areas that include present-day Uzbekistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, northern India, Banaras and as far south as Sanchi. 
which is in Madhya Pradesh, near Bhopal. It was also a period of great wealth marked by extensive mercantile activities and a flourishing urban life, Buddhist thought and visual arts. The Gandha region at the core of the Kushan Empire was home to multi-ethnic society which was tolerant of religious differences and produced an eclectic culture vividly expressed in the visual arts produced during the Kushana period. Um, I am going to discuss one particular object which epitomizes this multi-ethnic, multi-religious, uh, political and religious uh, authority of the Kushans in relation to Gandharat. And this is the very famous Kanishka reliquary which is being, you know, uh, uh, which was found at Shah Ji Ki Dheri. This was discovered in 1908-1909 at Shah Ji Ki Dheri which is uh, uh, and uh, during an excavation in a deposit chamber under the monumental Kanishka stoop. There is an inscription in Kharoshti which reads Maharajasa Kanishkasa Kanishka Pure Nagare Aya Gada Kare Deya Dharme Sarva Satva Nahita Su Suha Artha Bhavatu Mahasenasa Sagharake Dasa Aghisala. Now, this is controversial. Some read it as Agnishala, some have read it as Agisala. Navkarmi Anna Kanishkasa Vihare Mahasenasa. Now, in the town of Kanishkapura, this perfume box is the pious donation of the architects of the fire hall of Mahasin and Sankharakshita in the monastery founded by Maharaja Kanishka. May it be for the welfare and happiness of all beings in acceptance of the teachers of the Sarvastivadi school. So, we know that uh, there is a fire hole probably, uh, this was something that was made by in a temple by Kanishk, fire hole means that it had Zoroastrian uh, affiliations. We do know that there was a large uh, amount, uh, a large population of Iranians who had brought their beliefs uh, into this. We also have another inscription which also talks about the acceptance and patronage of these beliefs by the Kushanas. It also talks about uh, the building of a monastery uh, by a Kanishk. Um, okay. And uh, it, it also talks about the fact that this was for the welfare of the Sarvastivada school, which is uh, something that is uh, also there in Sanchi. And we have a lot of uh, people who, monks who belong to the school who are traveling all over uh, north and northwestern India belonging to this particular school of Buddhist thought and philosophy uh, during the early Christian eras. And with them are traveling Buddhist thoughts, Buddhist art, Buddhist culture and many such uh, cultural and religious practices. Now, this particular stoop has a literary history also. It is mentioned in literature of or uh, the writings of travelers, especially Chinese travelers who were coming into India. Uh, and Fayan, uh, who came in around 400 CE, uh, during the Gupta period says that when the Buddha was traveling in the country in the past, he told Ananda, after my nirvan, after my death, there will be a king an, uh, named Kanishka who will intend to raise a stupa at this spot. Afterwards, Kanishka was in the world and when the king was going on tour of inspection, Shakra, that's Indra, who intended that the king's mind be open to Buddhism, was raising a stoop on the road, disguising himself as a little cowherd. 
what are you making? The king asked. He answered the king, I'm making a Buddhist stoop. So, what we have here is that you have Fayan uh, and uh, he's talking about how this stoop came into being. And uh, the king, of course, looking at this, um, uh, started uh, creating a greater stoop. Okay? Uh, and he built right, one right over the boy's stoop, which was very big and decorated with precious substances. And it had viharas. And uh, Nafayan had seen these. And it was of majestic grandeur. It was amongst the uh, best or the grandest stupas of Jambudwi, that is India. Uh, okay. And not only this, but Tang dynastic histories also mention this stoop as this Hyun Sang uh, in his Suyuki when he is coming into India he is also coming uh, and looking at the stoop and he mentions this stoop. So there is a literary kind of a history of the stoop which we need to know uh, that uh, there is a history of art that is being recorded of architecture that is being recorded by people who are uh, coming just after it, is be, it has been built and marveling at its uh, size, its grandeur, its massiveness and the uh, patronage that it is giving to Buddhism. Now, this is the Kanishka reliquary that was found during excavations inside this particular stoop that we are talking about. Now, if you will look at this, this is made of gilded copper. Okay. And interestingly, what is a reliquary in which relics were kept? It is said that in this bone relics or titut relics of uh, Buddha himself were kept. Here you, we see that we have three figures on the lid. These represent Buddha right in the middle. As you can see, he is he has one hand raised in a bhai uh, and he is seated on what looks like a lotus pedestal. Right? We can see the lotus uh, petals on the lid on both sides paying obeisance to the Buddha we have Indra and Brahma. Both are divine characters and we can see that and their divinity is shown through the halos or the prabhas behind their heads. But interestingly, what we also notice here is that the characteristic features of Gandhar art, which are uh, the wavy hair, the um, rigid lines of, uh, uh, very well defined lines of the drapery, the sanghati on both shoulders, etc., are already here during the first century CE. Okay. Besides this, we have the portrait sculpture of the king himself, who uh, probably the king himself, and this can be kind of uh, also seen uh, when we look at uh, various coins, numismatic sources and even some sculptural sources that this represents Kanishk. Uh, the way he wears his tunic, uh, the boots and the trousers as well as the row, uh, the, this kind of a scarf represents the emperor Kanishk himself. He is surrounded by the sun and the moon gods on both sides. You know, on these, um, these coils of the wine, you can see these two gods. The coils of the wine are something that you see on the Ushnish at Bharut and at Sanchi, especially at Bharut. Okay? But what you see here are these two gods and these two gods are representations not only of Surya and uh, Soma, but they are representations of Iranian gods, Miro and Mao, uh, which are 
uh, represents sun and the moon. Now, this again is that you have Buddhist Indian elements, you have uh, Iranian Scythian Parthian elements, we have uh, drapery which is uh, of Buddha, which is Greco Roman in its uh, influence. So, all these influences are getting amalgamated into this reliquary. So, that becomes why it becomes very representative of what we see. Okay? And then we also have here the Buddha surrounded by cherubs with devotees or bodhisattvas all around him. So, that is also something that you see. Now, we are just going to look at another Kushan uh, inscription we, before we go on to narrative sculptures which is a very important find in the recent years uh, which is the Ravatak temple foundation inscription which was found on a stone plaque which gives us a genealogy of the king and how Kanishk is actually ordering images of gods to be made. So, there is a reference to patronage of art by the king in this particular region uh, and this is something that is important you know and secondly he gives orders to make images of not only gods but also of his own ancestors. So, he asks for images of uh, Kujula Cadphysis who is his great grandfather, King Vima Taktu his grandfather and Vima Cadphysis his father. Now, interestingly we have another name uh, which we did not know in the genealogy which is Vima Taktu which is coming in the Rabatak inscription. Uh, uh, he also talks about uh, uh, temple building. So, not only images but also temples, institutions, architecture is something that is being encouraged by the Kushans and it says that may, may these gods who are inscribed here keep the king of kings, Shanushai, Kanishk the Kushan for ever healthy, fortunate and victorious and the king, the son of the gods was pacifying all of India from the year 1 to the year 6. He was uh, probably conquering a lot of territories during this time. So, the temple was founded in the year 1, then in the third year uh, many rites of endowment what took place, then attendants were attached to this and he even gave a fortress to the gods and made a uh, canal. This was uh, translated. Okay. Uh, now, we come to the second aspect of uh, Gandhar art. We have freestanding sculptures of uh, Buddha and the Bodhisattva, but a large amount of Buddhist art has also been found in and around stupas and viharas in architectural context and this art is mainly narrative in content. By narrative we mean that it talks about stories and legends and myths related to the Buddha. While relics remain central to the devotional practices and stupas came to be embellished with narrative reliefs that recounted the Buddha Shakyamuni's miraculous life and emphasized his physical presence at the site. Gandharan narrative reliefs are distinguished from North Indian narrative reliefs in their emphasis on the linear unfolding of events. Uh, narratives are told within horizontal frames. So, narratives are one after the other, you know, first one thing happens, then another, the next thing, the next thing. So, you do not have a jumbling up of moments from time, okay. So, you have a linear kind of a narrative, one chronological, thematic, etc. Okay. In 
the emphasis is mainly on Buddha's life, all right. So, they depict many scenes from Buddha's life through his birth, enlightenment, first sermon and Mahaparinirvan are the key events uh, which are also mentioned from the early Buddhist manuscripts that have been found from this region from 1st century BCE. Now, this is something that is now being studied a lot and this is a new intervention in Gandharan and North Western studies which is to look at Gandharan textual tradition because till now Gandharan art was something that was being emphasized. Recent um, discovery of a lot of manuscripts or scraps of manuscripts, these are not entire extant manuscripts, but we found some scraps which can be dated to early centuries of the Christian era and these are Mahayan texts, so quite a few of these are Mahayan texts and th there is an attempt now to look at what is it that is being said in these texts. Uh, are these mentioning the same things that are being done and visualized in art or is there a kind of a difference between what is being said in literary tradition and what is being said in the visual tradition. And this is something that makes it very interesting and a new uh, kind of a study that needs uh, that is being done and we need to have a look at that also. Okay. Gandharan manuscripts have several narratives about the Buddha's present and previous lives with overlaps and surprising discrepancies with motives in Gandharan Buddhist art. So, they, they need not be the kind of the way say Buddha's birth is described in literature may not be the way it is shown in art. And they supply a valuable written evidence for the emergence and development of Gandharan Buddhist literary traditions in the regional vernacular language of Gandhar. The absence of many of the moments that are mentioned in the Gandharan literary tradition in the visual narratives suggests divergent lines of development of Jataka narratives in Gandhar literary and visual cultures. By this we mean that you know perhaps both the visual and the literary culture were borrowing from an oral tradition but were visualizing this or interpreting it very differently. What was being interpreted by the artists was something that was suited to show, being shown. What was being interpreted or taken appropriated from the oral tradition of folk tales of the Jatakas that were being circulated in North Northwestern India uh, by the uh, people who were writing these downs, who were actually codifying these was different. Maybe they were looking more at the philosophical, metaphysical, uh, hagiographic elements in these texts, uh, in these traditions, oral traditions and then fixing them in literary textual tradition uh, while the uh, narratives were looking more towards the visual and the oral practices. Now, if we were to look at uh, some of the events that are being shown, uh, one of the most prominent and uh, oft repeated event is the birth of Buddha. Both the conception and the actual birth. The conception of Buddha or what is popularly known as the dream of Maya is something that is slightly less in number compared to the uh, actual birth narratives. Here we see that uh, Maya Devi is lying down and is almost asleep and she dreams that a white elephant is entering her womb, actually it circles her around her three times and then she feels that it enters her womb etc. 
this particular narrative is shown before at Bharut and other places, but the, here it becomes more lively, realistic and um, now this is also very interesting and this is something that is interpreted very, very differently in, in other places, but this is uh, a kind of interpretation of the dream or uh, the, the reading of his horoscope by the uh, by the uh, court astrologers. You see Buddha's father Shudhudan on one side, you see the court attendants on one side and in the middle you see this sage or an ascetic in his uh, dhoti or uh, and no, non-royal clothes um, and he holds this baby, this divine baby. You can see the divinity uh, because of the halo around the head. So it is a very interesting kind of an interpretation. There are other astrologers also who are present uh, who were invited to predict about the future of this particular uh, event. Okay. So, uh, there are other matted uh, Jatam, uh, Jatam Muk or Jata Hari mendicants. All right. Now, we come to the depiction of the birth of Buddha. All right. Here, if you were to see, what, what do we have? We have uh, Maya Devi in the center, okay, and emerging from her side is the baby Buddha, the divine presence of the Buddha. Now, this is because this uh, he is a Mahapurush, and Mahapurushes really are uh, not born in an ordinary way but are born from the side, okay of the mother. He emerges from the side and is received by the Vedic gods, uh, Surya, Indra, uh, Brahma. Okay. On the other side is the secular side and you see the attendants of Maya Devi who can be seen. She holds, if you look above, she holds a branch of the tree the Shala tree, it say it the tradition of the biography say that when Buddha was born uh, was about to be born, she felt the birth pains and held on to a Shala tree in the forest of Lumbini and gave birth to the Buddha, which you can see here. The other thing that you can notice here is the way in which the narrative is framed. Uh, this is very and the way in which women, uh, the garments that women and men wear, which have been inspired partly by Roman togas and Roman feminine apparel. Uh, uh, to an extent, there is some influence of Scythian uh, also. All right. Now, here we have four scenes from the birth of Buddha. Okay. Uh, in the middle, of course, you can see is uh, basically here, you can see here the uh, uh, birth of the actual birth, the receiving of the Buddha by the gods, etc. Right? There are more of these depictions. I just, I am taking more examples of these because you can see how popular this particular depiction was. Perhaps this showed, uh, this emphasized the divinity. It also emphasized the importance of the moment when uh, Buddha made an appearance in his final form uh, here. Right? Again, <coughs> many, many scenes are not shown 
anywhere else except in Gandhar, such as this return to Kapilvastu or are rare in other places. This is something which you see here in uh, Gandhar, which is the return to Kapilvastu when uh, the baby was born in the Lumbini forest. After that, he came back to his um, uh, father's uh, palace at Kapilvastu and this particular depiction is that that you see and you can see the elaborate um, drapery, the, the design, the textile designs on it, the little baby uh, uh, also you know you can see some influence of uh, Mathura art in terms of style here. Then if we proceed further the uh, it says in the forecast of Buddha's future that in future this baby would leave and become, he might become a great king or he might become a great saint and if he does, he will leave all worldly delights and go. So this is before he leaves the palace, you can see that there are people sleeping, uh, his wife is sleeping, the, mendic uh, the attendants are sleeping and there is uh, a, the palace per particularly has been well delineated in terms of architecture. Uh, you have various arches, chete windows, uh, Indo-Corinthian pillars and in the middle uh, the prince is getting up from the bed about to depart. You know. So this particular scene na narrates that particular moment when he leaves the palace. Uh, this is the moment when uh, he leaves the palace and goes away and asks his uh, attendant and his horse Kanthaka to return. So this is Buddha bidding farewell to his horse Kanthaka who in this case actually kneels down to pay respect to his master and uh, the master can be seen as a divine presence again with his halo all right and that is important the divinity of Kanthaka uh, of the, uh, the importance the sovereignty is also suggested through the Chhatra, right? Now these are uh, uh, both from Takhte Bahi probably. So I am just trying to, you know, I've put them together. The one is an earlier instance, which is uh, uh, in the life of Buddha, which is his birth. But the second one, again, is something which is interesting, which is the gift of Anatha Pindika. In Bharut, we see the importance has been given to Anatha Pindika and his generosity. But here we see that it is the Buddha, okay, and this is a moustached figure of the Buddha that and his disciples you can see who are being emphasized and then you have the gift of Anath Pindika who gives the Jeta one uh, by spreading coins to all over the uh, garden in order to buy it and shows great generosity who is bowing in uh, obeisance to uh, the Buddha. Okay? So, and what you can see is gold foil. So, this is something that is a Buddhist practice which is still till today being practiced that uh, anywhere that Buddha's presence is felt, gold foil, um, just go, uh, what we call uh, work okay gold work is put on the uh, sculpture the pillar the stupa by pilgrims so this is the practice that was there for a long time all right now again this is from a uh, incident from the life of buddha which is the offering of a uh, handful of dust and you can see that uh, again, this has been set in uh, uh, some kind of a se semi-urban uh, setting 
and uh, you have the children, uh, you have the monks, you have the Buddha in and in two places where he is being offered a handful of dust in his uh, begging bowl and he is blessing them and the Buddha as the divine being with his principle and this is the detail right, of the scene. Now this is very interesting, um, this is something that is not really very often shown, this is a very rare kind of a thing and uh, uh, this is where Ananda intervenes on behalf of women wanting to enter the Sangha. Uh, the story is that Mahaprajapati who was the foster mother of the Buddha wanted to become a nun. And till then, only men were being allowed to enter the Sangha. And uh, Buddha refused thrice. Ananda, his foremost uh, disciple, intervened and said, Please let Prajapati and 500 other women who wanted to enter, enter, uh, become part of the Sangha, become stream enterers. And Buddha said, Okay, I will allow it. But by their entry, they are reducing the age of the faith or the path that I have created from 1000 years to 500 years. So he wasn't in favor of women entering the Sangha. And here you can see that there are these women who are beseeching Buddha to let them enter the Sangha. Then we have the final moment uh, which is Parinirvan and uh, this is taken also from mortuary art uh, in the Roman, found in the Roman catacombs. So that is something that is one of the inspirations here and uh, this is his death at Kushinagar. Uh, this should have come before but still this is descent from the uh, heaven where he preached to his mother right? uh, and when he was coming down at Sankish from this heaven the only witness was a nun called Utpalvarna and you can see this nun uh, here below and this is very interesting because uh, this is the only nun who's besides uh, Prajapati uh, who's actually shown and uh, you can see that there are in the heavenly realm there are various gods uh, who are bidding him goodbye and he is now about to descend the staircase. Um, before he attained enlightenment, uh, he was frightened by his cousin Mara who did not want him to attain enlightenment. And he sent his armies to disturb his uh, Buddha's meditations. But Buddha was not scared of this frightful army made up of grotesque beings. And he attained enlightenment and he touched the earth uh, to be his witness. And that is why you see Buddha seated with his one hand touching the earth in the Bhumi Sparsh Mudra declaring the fact that he had attained enlightenment. Okay, this is okay. Okay, we come now to the Deepanka Jatak. Okay. And we have also some Jataka tales, maybe not as many as you would have in other places, but you do have Jataka tales also being depicted in Gandhar. Uh, here also you can see evidence of gold foil that has been put on the uh, sculpture. Uh, what you see is the, the ascetic Megha who is the Buddha Shakyamuni in the past life appears three times here. Uh, there is the Buddha Dipankar. Uh, okay, uh, 
standing before him throwing flowers you can see him he is prostrated himself before the buddha and is spreading his matted locks so that buddha can step over him and third he is flying in the upper left panel in the in a gesture of veneration and uh, this is when uh, buddha uh, yeah, dipankar is the last uh, bodhisattva okay and uh, e, buddha dipankar predicts that in future life this particular ascetic megha will be reach enlightenment in the next life and become buddha shakya muni so this is the very very important to the narrative cycle of attaining buddhahood in the as historical buddha right and because it is so important it is been visualized and shown in many many forms at gandhar and it, and in fact it is one of the distinct features of gandhar art uh, dipankar jatak is not visualized in such detail in any other region of uh, early indian art as it is in gandhar here uh that here you can see that there is this entire philosophical metaphysical and narrative that has been shown where um, such wisdom etc these pledges are also being discussed this is a very interesting scene in terms of the way it has been composed with one foot coming out of the frame and um, the, uh, the the personage in the medallion also being uh, visualized so this is again in interesting now coming to other jatakas this is the shibbi jatak now shibbi jatak has been shown elsewhere we see shibbi jatak in uh, goli in uh, in andhra basically in and around andhra pradesh uh, during this period but uh, here uh, the uh, the actual bargain between the hawk and the dove is something that you see is demonstrated uh, this is about the generosity of the bodhisattva it is about a, a time when uh, buddha in his previous birth was the king shibbi and he was generous to a fault and uh, the hawk uh, one day shakra indra <clears throat> and brahma decided to test his uh, generosity and took the form of a hawk and a dove and uh, the hawk was about to eat the dove and the dove fell into shibbi's lap uh, or his presence and um shibbi said please don't kill him uh, but the hawk said okay what will you give the hawk agreed to leave the dove alone only if the king would offer a piece of flesh from his own body which was equivalent to the weight of the dove shibbi was more than happy but however much amount of flesh was taken out the dove kept becoming heavier and heavier and heavier and finally he put his entire self into the scales and even then the dove was heavier it was only uh, then that shak indra revealed himself and acknowledged the uh, divinity of the uh, bodhisattva and his generosity but here you can see the uh, the bird the dove you can see the weighing scales the cutting off of the flesh uh, the uh, you know uh, indra okay now you, this is alambushi jatak which is the rishi shringa jatak which shows how once upon a time uh, one horned bodhisattva was born from a doe we've seen this particular jataka also as isimiga jatak in barhut okay 
besides this, we have various narrative scenes from the life of Buddha arranged on both sides or, or on sides of stairways, of stupas, of uh, various other monuments where uh, you see things like the great departure, the first sermon, the um, enlightenment, the quieting of the uh, elephant, Nallagiri. Uh, so you can see here, uh, right from the begin, uh, bottom upwards, so many of these scenes have been depicted. All right, right. And, uh, then you have offering of uh, sweet uh, rice pudding by Sujata just before his enlightenment. All right. Besides this, you have interspersion of uh, secular scenes such as wrestling also at times. But uh, you also have scenes such as the offering of um, honey by monkeys and other scenes from his life. There are other deities besides Buddha and B Bodhisattvas and Buddha in his previous life who are shown and depicted and visualized in Gandhara art. This is Hariti. Hariti is a Yakshi and she is also a Buddhist goddess. So she has twin roles. She has the role of protecting children and she has the role of being a Buddhist goddess and who is placed in almost all Buddhist monasteries in the front chamber. This is an inscribed, uh, as we have already mentioned before, inscribed art pieces from Gandhar are very rare. But this is an inscribed Hariti from Gandhar. The icon Hariti bears an inscription of two lines uh, and it says that the Hariti should protect the children. All right. It is also dated. It says in the year 291 on the 22nd of the month of Ashar, let the 10th carry up to a bright fortnight. I remember Hariti for the protection of this. You would notice that she is surrounded by children. That is because she is also bah Bahuputrika. That is a person, a woman with many sons. Legend has it that she had 500 sons and Buddha hid one of her sons, the youngest son, under his begging bowl because she was ca a cannibal and she was frantic. And when Buddha uh, revealed her son, uh, he said that, you know, the loss of one of 500 makes you so angry and so uh, uh, grief stricken. Think of those who have only one or two or five children. So, uh, since then, he, she accepted uh, Buddhism and uh, offerings started being made for to her and her children in the Buddhist tradition. In a similar way, dressed in a similar way is this royal lady who has simply been called Kambojika. This uh, is Mara's assault. And these are the grotesque creatures who form part of Mara's army. Harati is also seen as not only a deity, but she is also seen as the consort of Panchika who is actually Kubera. So, he is Yaksh, as Yaksha in the Buddhist tradition, he is known as Panchika Jambhal, but and he was married to Hariti. So, this is something that you see that he is um, a royal figure and Hariti is his consort and she holds a citron in her hand and she has children playing around her. In this particular posture, they are have been shown as a very happy domestic couple or um, who are also shown in Greco-Roman art, right? 
uh, this is the Mahayan Buddhist triad with Bodhisattvas, right? Uh, besides this, we also have a number of Bacchanalian scenes uh, in, from Gandhar. And interestingly, uh, wine drinking and wine making, especially wine making has also been something that has come across in, uh, during excavations from Buddhist sites. So this is something that also Buddhist monks were also making wine, they were perhaps drinking it. Uh, but uh, we also have this kind of convivial uh, social scenes where uh, men and women are shown as making wine as well as drinking wine in some kind of festival uh, perhaps or uh, a group activity. You can see here that they are holding cups of wine in their hands. There are besides royal and other figures, attendant figures. There are Buddhist, uh, besides Buddhist, there are also Brahmanical gods. This is Skanda Kartikai, uh, who is a very important and independent deity during this time. We see this in Mathura and we see this also in Gandhar. S similarly, we have a three-headed Shiva, uh, some marine deities or watermen entirely from the classical tradition who are shown carrying paddles. Uh, the other medium besides schist or stone is stucco which is kind of a plaster and here you see a head of a woman and this plaster tradition starts from 3rd century onwards only. You also have ivories. These ivories have been found from Begram which in a from a palace perhaps of a royal or a mercantile person. These are pieces of furniture. So these are tables and these are chair bags. And uh, you can see that uh, a lot of uh, images of Shal Bhanjikas, Yakshis, which you see also in uh, Mathura have been adapted to this. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am, uh, mm. for this uh, wonderful uh, lecture and we had a look at uh, wonderful paintings as well and uh, that adds to the uh, interesting uh, aspect of the lecture, of course, very visual uh, appeal. So, uh, friends, uh, we have uh, now had a look at, uh, we have had these two lectures on Gandhar art and of course, we are going to request ma'am to share a bit about what she uh, would like to talk in the future with us and uh, before we sign out. So, ma'am. I would like to uh, discuss cave art and architecture because we have over 800 to 900 caves that were excavated from about 300 BCE to the time of Elora, you know. So we have all over right. eastern to western India on both sides of the coast we have so many caves and what is it that made people excavate these caves, what made them decorate these caves, these are some of the aspects that I think we should also look at. And Definitely. Look. Thank you for sharing, ma'am. And so, friends, we uh, request you to look forward to uh, lectures on cave art and uh we will uh, definitely be putting up our schedule soon so you could have a look at that. So thank you so much ma'am again and thank you viewers. Keep watching. Have a wonderful day ahead. 